Thank you for tuning in to another episode of InRange. Uh, today I've got a unique opportunity to talk to you about the two most prominent semi-automatic German rifles of World War II. There were others, of course, like the FG-42, which was select fire, and of course the STG-44, which was select fire, but these were the semi-automatics. These were essentially Hitler's Gerens. There's a book called Hitler Gerens, in fact, and uh, it's a good resource for this documentation. But in that regard, since we have both of these rifles here for a short duration of time, what I thought I would do is talk to you about the differences between the two, why they went from the G41 to the G43, and how these things handle not only in the field but on the clock as well. Because I've actually used the G43 in some matches, uh, two gun matches. I have never used the G41 and probably never will. The G41, especially one in this condition, is a particularly rare gun. And one that's an all matching specimen like this one really doesn't warrant being beat up the way it might at a two gun match. This is truly a collectible. The G43s are collectibles as well, but they were produced in much larger numbers than the G41, and that's for good reason. But let's first talk about the story here. So of course, when World War II starts, the Wehrmacht is standardized on the Car 98K, a bolt action rifle, chambered at 7.92 by 57 Mauser, 190 grain bullet, 98 grain bullet, very potent cartridge. And as the, the, the war continues, the need for a semi-automatic rifle is certainly one that everyone comes to realize is a reality. Um, they're facing the SVT-40 and of course later the M1 Garand. And there was design going on for quite a while to, to figure out a solution for that on the German side of the conflict. The High Command issued a uh, request to a number of manufacturers to develop a semi-automatic rifle and the request had a lot of very strange features required in it. One of which was to not drill a gas port in the barrel. Another was one for the gun to actually be able to be functioned and manipulated with the same manual of arms as a bolt action rifle. Two manufacturers tried to address this initially, Mauser and Walther. Mauser developed the G41M and that was a dumpster fire of a rifle. In trying to conform to all of the requirements of high command, meaning that it was actually functional as a bolt action rifle as well as a semi-automatic, no gas port in the system, they developed a very fragile, overly complex gun that was developed in very small numbers and in the field was universally hated. In fact, there are accounts of soldiers receiving the G41M, a semi-automatic rifle, and just giving it to someone else because they'd rather stick with their Car 98K. To actually go back to a bolt-action rifle from what is ostensibly a semi-automatic tells you a little bit about how bad the G41M is. They're very scarce today, very rare, very valuable, but they're very bad, not good rifles. The G41W, Walther, didn't conform to the requirements of high command. They read them, and someone at Walther uh, essentially was switched on and went, this is a ridiculous set of requirements, and we're not going to attempt to fulfill nearly all of them. What they did do is conform to the requirement of having no gas port drilled in the barrel. Other than that, they developed a reasonably reliable, resilient, durable semi-automatic rifle uh, with that one strange gas requirement. The gas system in this gun is called the bang system. In fact, the original M1 Garand was developed with the same and quickly removed that out and went, went to a long stroke gas piston. Um, this system is unique and very unusual in that it's one of the very few military rifles ever issued that use this gas system in any large numbers. So how this functions is you have the barrel which acts as essentially a essentially a guide rod and then there's a puck which acts like the piston that rides around the barrel and then this slides on the barrel and this cone then screws onto the front end. As gases leave the muzzle the gases are pushed around the barrel and that puck is reciprocates over the barrel like a piston, striking two op rods on each side of this gun, which then cycles the bolt carrier, unlocking the gun and cycling in another round. Here is your vent holes, the pucks right here, we'll get into that more in a moment. What this does do is not have a gas port in the barrel, which everyone at that time thought, or at least in the Germans thought, that that was going to erode and cause issues. Really, their lifetime of these guns in the field, it didn't matter, it would have never mattered. However, what it does do is break a bunch of weird parts laying at the end of this gun, which makes the total balance of this very front heavy. It's very hard to shoot this offhand accurately. It can be done, but it's difficult. It makes the gun heavier in general, and the reciprocating mass and such also makes the, the recoil impulse also challenging to get shot for shot recovery, even though it's a semi automatic gun. I will tell you that this gun shot from a prone or supported position is very comfortable. The gas system in that regard is quite mild because you can rest the weight of this on something and then the weird balance issues are sort of mitigated. But this turned out to be a disaster in the field. The soldiers didn't like it. It required a lot of field maintenance and field maintenance on the eastern front in the winter in the mud is not something you want to be required to do regularly. 
and as a result there were a lot of complaints and there was a decision to fix the gas system on this gun. The fixing of the gas system came in the guise of the G43. Now the G43 gas system uses a short stroke gas piston. They copied the gas system essentially directly off of the SVT-40, the Russian sample, the Russian semi-automatic rifle, and in the process what they did is they intentionally overgassed this gun dramatically uh, to keep it reliable in the field. This is when it's interesting that the original requirements for not having a gas port was to increase the durability and lifespan of the rifle, and then at this point they purposely intentionally increased the gas system to the point where the gun essentially shoots itself to pieces over time, and they did that for reliability in the field because they realized that the lifespan of these guns in the field, in the hands of a soldier on the eastern front, could be measured sometimes in minutes, and as a result, the reliability and durability of the gun's long-term uh, capabilities was no longer relevant. That said, if you were to get a G43 today to shoot it, you need to modify the gas system with an aftermarket gas system. I have one in here. I'll talk about that later. But what that does is allows you to shoot the gun safely. A number of things changed on these guns throughout the course of their development, and that's what I want to talk about today. Um, one of which was the G41 originally was designed to have a saddle mount scope system with the ZF41. The ZF41 is a 1.5x DMR type optic. It's not really a sniper, sniper rifle, sniper scope. It allows you to have a little better accuracy in the field because you have a single point of focus. You don't have to focus on a front sight and a target. You just focus on the target and of course using an optic you can superimpose the reticle on it. This saddle mount was issued in extremely small numbers. It does not hold zero very well and as a result they kind of ditched this idea very quickly although a number of them were still manufactured with these scope rails built into the receiver for that purpose. Actual field use of the saddle mount and the ZF-41 on the G-41 is close enough to zero to consider it never really being used. They decided to increase the capabilities of the G-43 when they went to it by adding an integrated scope rail. This one actually does retain zero, but it does not mount the ZF-41, it mounts the ZF-4, which is a 4X optic. That right there gives you a much better optic sighting system. This is a really good optic. It is 4X. It is adjustable for both elevation and windage. And you can still use the iron sights with the relatively high offset optic. Now, that said, this was intended to be a sniper rifle. Accuracy, however, in field trials turned out to not present itself for what a sniper would want. This really is a DMR, a designated marksman rifle. And there's a number of accounts from books in which Snipers use these as DMRs out to 300 meters, and within 300 meters, this gun does a very good job. After that, for precision shots, this starts falling off. The system that was developed for this just is not that inherently that accurate, and as well as late war manufacturing and materials lent itself to not being a very accurate rifle. It's a good combat gun for its short lifespan. It is a good DMR with a scope on it. It is not a good sniper rifle. While many of them, or all of them, had this scope rail milled into the frame or the receiver of the gun, they, very few of them were actually issued with the scope. So this scope is kind of an anomaly. You'll see them very frequently with scopes. Collectors like to put scopes on them, but the reality is scopes were not really that much of a thing in the field, and there were snipers that used them as DMRs, but that's about that. However, another thing that's a very interesting analysis between these two guns is to watch how the manufacturing processes changed to be able to manufacture more of them rather than less of them because the loss rate on the Eastern Front of men and rifles was extreme. So in that regard, if we look at the G41, you'll see that it seems to function very similarly. It's got a cover here, it's got a dust cover, it's got a bulk carrier group. G41 locks back on the last fired round, has a stripper clip guide here to chamber two five round stripper clips for a capacity of 10 rounds in a fixed box magazine. This entire unit is one giant explosive spring unit. So what happens is to disassemble the gun, you bring it back, lock it like that, put it on safe, depress this spring right here, and as a result this will lift up and out, and this is your field strip of the gun. You can then wipe this down. You can take this down further. It is currently completely held by spring tension by this little latch. If you were to release this latch right now, this thing will explode across everywhere. Pieces will fly, I'm not joking, far away. In fact, it's dangerous to your eyes. If this were to open up with this pointed at you and you were not being cautious, you could actually hurt yourself with this. There is a lot of spring pressure and tension in this unit. 
But to demonstrate how similar the G41 is to the G43, I'm going to go ahead and show you that real quick. So this is the G41 bolt carrier group, for lack of a better term. And now let's go ahead and take a look at the G43 one. So a couple of things changed. First of all, the bolt carrier group uh, or the dust cover or guide cover on the G41 is milled. This is a piece of milled steel and that was part of the original design requirements. This is actually quite durable and even in an overgas system this milled system will do quite well and be very resilient. You have to realize that this entire unit is slamming back into the rear of this if the springs get a little weak and as a result there's a lot of pressure being applied, force I should say, being applied to the rear of this system. This is your bolt stop right here. It's not the gun, this is the bolt stop which comes out like this. This being milled made it strong enough and safe enough for that design. However, milling metal and materials is costly and expensive as well as very resource intensive. So when they went to the G43, a very small number of them were manufactured with this milled type system, but they went to stamped sheet metal. This was a, a way to speed up the production cost, the production of the gun, as well as to reduce the raw materials required to do this. However, this stamped sheet metal piece is extraordinarily weaker than the original milled one. It functions the same, but what happens is almost all of these guns, every sample I've ever seen, with rare exception, is a few I made that I haven't, the rear here, especially when they're still overgassed and someone hasn't changed the gas system, starts cracking at the rear of this stamped sheet metal cover, guide. Uh, as a result, this starts failing here, and when it gets bad, you'll actually see the, it'll start bending pieces in the rear of the gun, the safety will pop out, and this is all based on not only a reduction of costs and raw materials by using stamped sheet metal, but the overgas system of the G43. Again, in the field, the loss rate was so extreme this wasn't relevant, but nowadays if you're going to use one of these guns and you don't downgas the gun, these will fail. And even when you downgas the gun, these stamped sheet metal pieces will eventually start cracking. I've seen two or three of them now, and I've even had a few do it myself, and this gun is properly gassed. I was able to acquire one milled cover that I used with this gun that was off of a G41 that when I want to shoot it, but I have the stamped sheet metal on because this is how the gun was typically issued now and produced in the largest numbers. So let's go ahead and show you how similar the field strip is. Bring this back, lock it, on safe, push the button, and that comes right out. Now, to those of you paying attention, these are essentially identical with a few small differences. A reduction of quality. I mean, you can tell here we've gone from really quite high quality production of the bolt carrier and this unit the general cover slash guide and you're now looking at this which is of course roughly finished on the outside but properly finished on the inside for reliability stamped sheet metal this is a this is a solid charging handle this is hollow these are all reduction of cost and time to make more of the guns in fact it got to the point where they even started emitting this little button here so you couldn't lock this as one unit like this which made it harder to field strip but that was near the end of the war so let me show you how similar these guns are, in fact, and then I'm going to take the unit off of the G43, and I'm going to actually install it into the G41. Uh, that's how similar these parts are. In fact, the interchangeability of parts between the G41 and the G43 is very high. With the exception of the gas system and the detachable box magazine, these guns are virtually identical. Um, another difference, which the keen eyed of you might have noticed, is that the charging handle is on different sides, and that's because they decided to put, as I mentioned earlier in the video, a scope rail on the right side of the G43, and the charging handle being on the left would, of course, impede that and would cause a problem, so they just merely moved the charging handle to the right. Now, let's go deeper dive into how these guns function. Both of these guns function the same. They're both flapper locks. So I'm going to go ahead and take the G43 system apart as that's the less valuable of the two. Push this down on a hard surface, unlock it. This is going to be under a lot of spring pressure. These two pieces come apart. This now stamped sheet metal piece can be set to the side. The dust cover is reciprocal. They went through multiple different versions of this dust cover on the G43 all of them in the effort of cost reduction. This was the earlier version, which is automatic. It is actually open and closed as the bolt carrier guide, as the bolt carrier reciprocates on this guide. 
Later versions were manual and you have to push it forward just to reduce one cost of material and manufacturing. Things were getting that bad at the end. You have your spring guide rod, two springs, it's a dual spring unit, like this. Then you have your bolt carrier, which comes out. Again, interchangeable with the G41 with the exception of the side charging handle. And then you have flappers. So, if we put the guide, the carrier back in, and I start moving this, you're going to see those flappers open like this when the gun is in battery. These are now would be locked in a recess in the receiver. Then as gas strikes the gas system, on a G43, the op rod strikes the front right here of this carrier. This slides back, which then unlocks these locking lugs or flappers, which then reciprocates the gun back, forward, and then when it goes back in the battery, those flaps go out and lock into two sides of the receiver. The G41 works identical to the G43. The only difference is the charging handle side. These parts are all essentially interchangeable. You could take this part on here, put it on here. You could take the bolt, put it into this one. You could take the flappers off. Now, you are messing with headspace when you do that, but otherwise, these parts aren't changed. The G41 and G43 are mechanically and dimensionally the same or close enough that it doesn't matter. Um, in that regard, so imagine this in the field, however. I want to go ahead and clean this. You could pull this whole unit apart and keep it contained, but if you needed to clean this further, you pull the bolt carrier off, then you pull out the firing pin assembly, like this, and then, watch this. All right, so we have our bolt, firing pin assembly, and wedge. This is what causes the uh, flappers to actually engage. And then you have these flaps that are now just loose and floating around. They do have a notch on one to indicate the proper side to put it in, but this is how you have these parts now in the field. Imagine this on the eastern front, trying to deal with this on top of having to clean the bang gas system. Um, that was not well received. Let me show you what it's like to put this back together. So you have to kind of put the flaps in. This. Then you put the other one in. This is, I'm serious, this is not... I just screwed that up. All right, that flapper just fell out. Probably would have fell into the dirt and mud of the eastern front. Oh, God. There we go. Easier if you do it like this. So now I have the flaps installed into the bolt. Then I put the firing. This can go down further. I'm not going to go further with it. In fact, you can see that it was coming out. I'm going to put the wedge back in. You can see the flaps went out as I put the wedge back in. And now that's essentially back together-ish. We then have to guide the bolt carrier into that recess. Then we have to put the springs back into the system. Then we have to guide this guide and cover on until the little plunger comes out the rear. Let's do that outside of that actually. So we put this in. There you go. Then you put the spring over the guide rod like that. Then you have to get the dust cover to be underneath this while you guide the guides into the sides of the bolt, car the bolt carrier. Then you push it back under strong spring pressure and then lock it in place. This is now once again under extreme spring pressure. If I were to unlock this, this would explode everywhere. The G41 is no different. These are exactly the same with the exception of the quality of manufacture, milled parts, and the sides of the charging handle. Otherwise, they are functionally the same. The G43 does also still retain a charge, a, excuse me, a stripper crib guide, but these are stamp sheet metal and they do eventually bend out of shape. I can tell you that's the case. I've actually done it on the clock. You kind of push it back into, into shape afterwards. The milled gun has no such issue as the quality is much higher. However, that would be the field strip of the G43 and G41 bolt carrier group. Put that to the side. Um, another issue to mention about the flapper locks is that those flappers, there's one on the left and one on the right, and when these are going into battery into the receiver, it is possible to only get a locking surface on one of the two flappers if this is out of spec. You can actually be firing this gun with only having one side locked. The flapper system turned out to not be the best, and of course, later on, that wedge turned into a development for the delayed roller G3, and of course, very late war experimental STG45s. But that wedge system, imagine those flaps being turned into rollers going into recesses, and then you can see the origins of what became the G3 delayed roller system in the G41 and the G43.
All right, so let's talk about the gas system on this. Let's start with the G41, which is the Bang gas system, the one that was the high command's requirement to not have a gas port drilled in the barrel. I'm gonna go ahead and push the plunger. There's a plunger right here that keeps this cone on. So you press the plunger in. Ugh. And start turning this. I'm gonna do it with my finger, it might be easier. Yeah, it is. So I'm gonna, you just keep turning this, this little cone, until the cone comes off. Now, this is a clean, well-maintained gun. Uh, in the field, if this had been fired and carboned up, this would have been much harder to take off. And in fact, there were sometimes tools for that purpose. And you can see that there are cuts on this to be able to use a wrench around it if you should need to, and it's rusted in place. Um, so that little plunger is depressed, that cone comes off. This is the forcing cone that the gas is escape around the muzzle and then go down into this gas chamber here. This then comes right off like that. This is essentially your gas cylinder and you've got vent holes here, 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 and here. You'll notice the front sight comes off with that. That's another issue as the gun gets worn and the splines start becoming deformed, your windage zero will get weird. This gun's really tight and in perfect condition. However, that's a real problem and taking your front sight on and off is probably not the best idea. This is the puck I was referring to earlier. If you guys have ever used a Saiga 12, this might look familiar to you. This is what rides around the barrel, with the barrel being essentially the guide rod for the gas system. This is the op rod, which then cycles back and forth like this, thus striking the bolt carrier and cycling the gun. So you have to clean this in the field and all of the carbon and remember we were using uh, corrosive ammo at this time, of course, all of those corrosive salts are depositing on the barrel and around this action. So this has to be cleaned reliably or it will definitely seize up and freeze. So put this back on, then start screwing the cone back on. You have to depress the plunger and then it'll click and that's it. That's the gas system. You can see there's a lot of mass and weight at the front of the gun. You see that that puck is there. This will get fouled up eventually and this is a problem. It was never a good system and it was all based on the requirement to not drill a gas port in the barrel from high command. It was a stupid concept. It was never should have been done that way. All right, so the Germans encountered the SVT-40 in the field and they look at the gas system on that. It's using a short stroke gas system. I'm going to go ahead and also loosen the sling on this one just because it makes things easier. And so you're going to see the gas system here has changed dramatically. So we push this little plunger down and open up this nose cap. Okay, that comes right off. That can stay on with the sling. The barrel, of course, stays there. The front sight is not being removed at this point. This little wooden handguard comes off. And now this is an aftermarket gas system. It's functionally identical to the original gun. The difference is that its port diameter has been changed so that the amount of gas being put into the system is less. And I have a little rubber buffer here to not deform this op rod against the receiver. That's so I can shoot the gun safely. So we pull this to the, to the back. This little part comes out right there. And that. And that. So here we have our, we have our piston and cylinder. We have a transfer assembly and an op rod with a return spring. This is now what strikes the bolt carrier group, bolt carrier to unlock the gun. This of course is where the gas fills this cylinder until it comes back and it starts venting out. There are some that have vent holes and some that do not. And then you have this transfer assembly. On the aftermarket third party gas systems, this is where you put in a essentially a a hole, you have you can take out different screws, Allen headed screws, and change the gas diameter hole and a gas port diameter, and that's how much gas is going into the system. So you can down gas this gun and not destroy it in the field. This is what you replace. I put the original parts in a bag, um, and so much easier to clean. It is no longer fouling around the barrel, it is no longer have it doesn't longer has a puck in it. This is obviously a much better system. So to put this back together, cylinder back on, op rod. Pull it to the rear, put in the transfer assembly, close it, and you are good to go. So, once again, how this would cycle, fire the gun, 
Gas comes now out of a gas port in the barrel. Oh my, we are now violating that principle. Gas comes down the piston, fills this cylinder, it reciprocates, vents out, goes back into battery, cycles the gun. Now, a couple things I've done to make this gun less likely to beat itself apart. I have, of course, replaced it with a third-party gas system. I have this rubber buffer to ensure that I'm not damaging the receiver or this op rod. And I've added a little washer. This may look crazy to you, but there's a washer here. And that washer is actually there to change the overall dimensions between this and that. So what I, what I mean by that is when this is in battery and closed, you want this op rod to be in contact with the front of the bolt carrier. If the op rod is a little bit back, what happens is when the gun fires, the op rod slams into this, starts deforming the front of the op rod and mushrooming out. Bad steel, end of the war. Now, maybe not good or inconsistent hardening processes. And then it also starts causing problems on the front of your bolt carrier. So you want to make sure that the op rod is touching this in a gun that you plan to actually be firing consistently or with some regularity when it's in battery. And by adding a little washer there, you can increase the overall length of the op rod just a little bit so that it's in contact with the bolt carrier when you fire the gun. Anyways, that's a little bit eccentric. Once you're done cleaning this, you just put this cover back on, close this, spring, boom, you've now cleaned the gas system. As you can tell, this is a much, much better system than that original bang gas trap system. The M1 Garand, when it used it, was called a gas trap, but it's technically the bang system. This is a huge improvement, directly copied from the SVT-40. Other big differences between the G43 and G41, we should probably mention the obvious one. I mentioned that there are stripper clip guides both on the G41 unit and on the G43. G43 one's a little bit fragile, but there are stripper clip guides. Both can be charged with five rounds standard K98 stripper clips, but the G41 has a fixed box magazine and the G43 has detachable box magazines. These are 10 round capacity. This is 10 round fixed box magazine. These are detachable 10 round box magazines. And unlike Russian guns, these are actually interchangeable between guns. So a German G43 mag from another G43 will fit and function in every G43. I've never found one not work. I've played with the SVT-40 quite a bit, and the SVT-40 magazines and parts are not, and generally not interchangeable. They're serial number to the gun, and if you take one magazine from one SVT-40 and try to use it in another gun, it's probably not going to work reliably. But you can take a G43 mag from any G43, put it in any G43, and it will work. These were typically issued one mag in the gun, two mags in a pouch, and then a bunch of stripper clips from then on out. So you had 30 rounds in magazines, and then you had stripper clips after that. As, of course, the war continued to progress badly for uh, Germany, they started issuing just one mag with the gun and just stripper clips, started not even having pouches. You were lucky to have the one mag and some stripper clips and enough ammunition to keep the gun fed. But those are the major differences. Otherwise, these guns are virtually identical in every other way. They function identically. They lock identically. Um, the cleaning, of course, is much different between the G43 and the G41. But practically oriented in the field, the G43 is the much better rifle because you can keep it maintained. The gas system is simpler. It doesn't cause corrosion at the front of the gun. It doesn't have a bunch of weight and strange cycling parts at the front of the gun. Easier to fire and be accurate with and have follow-up shots. So the G43 became the standard issue, semi-automatic, full-power, 8mm Mauser gun for the, till the end of the war. The G41s continued to be used if they were around. Loss rates on the G41 and the 43 are extreme. The only reason there's a lot more G43s still around is because they made more of them, and they, uh, as a result, there's more of them. They made less of the G41s, and the loss rate on the Eastern Front was extreme in both regards. Let's go ahead and put the guns back together, and then have some conclusions. So we have our milled part right here. You go ahead and slide it into the receiver cuts, push the spring down, locks into place. You can take the safety off at this point. You can take that off. You can depress the follower in the fixed box magazine, and boom, that's it. That gun's back into, into ready-to-go condition, and you'll see that the G43 really isn't any different. Lock that into the receiver cuts, push in the, the plunger, take it off of safe, pull it back, unlock that, it will lock into the follower. Take out the magazine, it's easier. Close it, the magazine back in, the gun's ready to go. So, 
those are the major differences from a practical use application of both of the G41 and the G43 in the field. And I think that that will bring to light why the G41 wasn't around all that long and why it was a developmental dead end and why the G43 became the more standard issue gun, why the G41 is not that great in a practical environment and the G43 is better. Um, both of these guns are plagued with some issues in terms of flapper locking. As I mentioned, that wedge system will ultimately turn into the delayed roller G G3. So it's very interesting to see the gun's origin and how that landed up to be the case. But I would contend that if they were able to keep up the manufacturing quality capabilities that they were with the G41, such as the milled parts versus the stamp parts, you might have seen more developmental efforts with the G41-43 system post-war. But neither one of these guns were optimal, and really the M1 Garand uh, was a far superior semi-automatic rifle, fed faster, even though these are 10-round box magazines, you can keep an N-round N-block gun fed really quickly, and it was a much more reliable, resilient system. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. It was a rare opportunity. This G41 was only going to be here for a little while. The G43 is mine, the 41 is not. Hopefully you enjoyed this kind of stuff. I know this is more like a forgotten weapons thing, but I wanted to give you a more practical um, application of what these are like to use, not only but for shooting, but cleaning and maintenance in the field. And hopefully this video did a good job of that. Guys, InRange is entirely supported by Patreon only. We take no monetization from any ad revenue anywhere. It's strictly you, the, the viewer, that actually keeps InRange alive. If you are already a Patreon supporter, we thank you for that. You are a why we exist. If you are not, maybe you'll consider it. We have perks at all dollar levels, $1 and above. Um, as well as, if you can't do that, or you already are, please share this video with your friends and subscribe to one of our multiple distribution points. You can find them all on inrange.tv. Thank you very much.